Good morning. Welcome to New Life. Um, we have some announcements to go over, but this would be a perfect opportunity while we're going through announcements to silence your cell phone so we don't get embarrassed. Because I have had that happen to me, I think, maybe last week I had to turn my phone off. So we got a lot of stuff going on at New Life because uh, you guys like to be busy. Yes. Um, so we have a chili cook-off today, and hopefully you guys came hungry because I saw a few people already bringing some chili down there. And um, yeah, so uh, right following after uh, service, uh, we will have some chili. Uh, New Life Kids, so this morning, the fifth Sunday, if there is a fifth Sunday, uh, they are going to start having K through 6 up here with us, and it's a, there's a, um, I believe the intent there is so that our kids can start sharing in some of the message and some of the worship that we do, um, and I think that's awesome. So having the, uh, the youngsters up here will be, will be awesome. So that is going to be something you will see. There is activity packets and stuff. Uh, where would an activity packet be found? In the back, right here, boom, there is activity crack, uh, with, with crowns and, and stuff for them to stay busy if need be. But uh, the intent, again, is for them to get the same message we get. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> Thanks for forgiving me of that. He did not. <laughs> uh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, so anyway, moving on. Business meeting is February 6th, directly after service. Uh, that is our annual report to members and vote on bylaws and our new elder, the, the vote for the new elder. Uh, everyone is welcome. Members can vote. Uh, that's kind of how that works. Tech team. Dee and Mikey are kind of sharing that right now, and they do an amazing job, but uh, we, need, we need help to, to do that. So Mikey, raise your hand. Mikey is awesome. Super awesome. D is not here this week, but I think everybody knows D. There is so much that Mikey and D do that make this um, smooth and distraction free. Uh, you know, we it, structure is great, and it's not to be like do this. It just keeps us from distractions. So when we're trying to go to the Lord, we're not worshiping and then pulled over here because something went wrong, right? And um, Mikey does phenomenal. D does phenomenal. So. Um, if you are interested in serving on tech, let them know. Um, not on the list, but uh, we just had a really quick huddle, and we are um, piano, bass, acoustic guitar. If you know how to play piano, bass, or acoustic guitar, we would love to have um, you come speak with me um, or through anybody up here or that you know is on worship team. Hey, I'd like that. Uh, I do have a little bit of a process. We'll get into that. But if you're interested, talk to me. We'll, we'll kind of go there, but um, versatility is, uh, is beneficial on the worship team as well. So piano, bass, acoustic guitar. Um, Amy Graves, new life kids. No, life groups, life groups. life groups and so that is one of my joys and I'm part of the team that pulls that together each semester and so eat in your bulletin or the handout you got you each should have got a list of all of our different life groups and I am excited to say that we have almost every day there is something either in the mornings or in the evenings um, and throughout the week so there is something for everyone um, and so, but it does start this week. And so we ask that you would please um, pray and ask the Lord if this is a season that he wants you to get plugged in and in what area. Um, but we do have signups online and out in the foyer. And it just helps with knowing what books we need and what room sizes. So if that is something you're feeling like the Lord is leading you to, we ask that you sign up. And they do start this week. So if you have any questions, I will be floating around all morning and would love to answer those for you. Thanks. Awesome. You guys ready to worship? Yes. So, so I want to tell you a little story while you're still comfortable. So we went to see Winter Jam on Friday night, and it was amazing. And uh, I kind of had a relevation. If anybody's seen Good Dinosaur, I had a, it was, the, the, the night was amazing, but it was a lot of a performance. They were performing. These guys, Torn Wells and Skillet, and these, Skillet's a heavy rock band, but they, all their lyrics are around Jesus. And, uh, but it's a huge performance. It's not what we do on Sunday mornings where we worship. But the amazing thing to me was how they were able to take this 
I mean, we were there from, I don't know, 4 o'clock until 11 o'clock, and there was just so much performance. But they took that, and they bundled it into the, the lead singer of Skillet, bundled this 15-minute sermon, this message that was so powerful, that was so moving for the youth. This is a, this is a concert that's built around youth that um, it just opened my eyes to some of the things that I judgment. <laughs> As you, as you watch somebody else lead worship or somebody else, you know, whatever your position is, leading youth and, we, and, and pastor, we, we watch. And sometimes me, personally, I'm like, ah, they're doing that. And it's, they're not honoring God, right? It's not, and I do that. I, I don't know if anybody else does, but I'm just sharing my heart. And, and as they broke that down into a 15-minute devotion to these youth, it was one of the most moving things I'd ever seen. And it made me realize that... It doesn't matter what you're doing if you're doing it for the glory of God. It doesn't matter how you do it and what your approach is as long as what you're doing is rooted in Jesus Christ. And um, so this morning, however we worship, however you worship, just let it be judgment-free and free-flowing and just let it go because I can promise you one thing. Before we worship, we pray. And before we pray, we get in the Scripture. And um, so... A lot of this stuff comes from what God wants us to do, not what Justin or Jackie wants us to do. So um, I love Jesus, and everything we're about to do is for him and for his glory. And uh, hopefully you like it, but more so hopefully you're able to worship Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm on my knees again God, I'm begging please again I need you Oh, I need you Walking down these desert roads Water for my thirsty soul I need you Oh, I need you Your forgiveness it's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of the symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin Dead man walking, slave to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me under baptized. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change One more time, one more time Me want to change. 
your forgiveness It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water, your forgiveness It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips it's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin It's like holy water on my skin It's like holy water your feet linger here with you Lord and never leave yes I want to lay on your altar fan this flame with you Lord and stoke the embers I want to burn for you I want to burn for you Light me on fire I want to burn I want to burn for you I want to burn for you Light me on fire Cause I want to burn for you I want to live, yes I want to live From this place Where I meet with you Lord Face to face And there's no veil That can hide This glory will never fade Or ever die Cause I want to burn for you. I want to burn for you and light me on fire cause I want to burn I want to burn for you I want to burn for you light me on fire cause I want to burn for you do it again I want to burn for you I want to burn Light me on fire, cause I wanna burn I wanna burn for you I wanna burn for you Light me on fire, cause I wanna burn for you be a pleasing sacrifice 
The offering I choose, it's my life. Emptied of the old, filled with you. Oh, Jesus, I want to burn for you. Keep that down. Sing it again. Let this be a pleasing sacrifice. The offering I choose, it's my life. Emptied of the old and filled with you. Let's get excited. Oh, Jesus, I want to burn for you. Let this be a pleasing sacrifice. The offering I choose, it's my life. Emptied of the old and filled with you. Oh, Jesus, I want to burn for you. God's good, man. I think every time I wake up, we wake up, when we pray, we should be that on fire for God. Uh, he's amazing. He has done some pretty crazy stuff for me. I got to change this before I talk too much and get lost. Um, I'm going to share this, and I'm going to cry, and you guys will forgive me. On, on Friday night at the Winter Jam, Roughly two years ago, I was ready to end my marriage. And um, I wasn't living at home. And I was ready to, I actually did something that's really, I don't know, maybe you guys have done something similar. You know, you know that the path you're walking on is wrong and you continue to walk down it because it's easier. And you try to justify it. You try to reach out for things that make you feel like that's an okay decision. So if you know anything about my story, my dad left when I was 12. And my, our Zoe, you know my kids, so I don't have to tell you their age order. Zoe uh, was 12. Um, and I was in the exact same boat that my dad was in um, when I was 12. And I was making this decision to continue to walk away from my family and from my, from my kids and from my wife. And um, through her prayer, not mine, through her prayer, through her stubbornness and through her willingness to forgive me no matter what I had done, um, our marriage was, was mended and brought back. And I, I praise Jesus this morning for that. Um, it's better than it's ever been. Our marriage is stronger. Our bond is stronger. Our arguments are better and they're more fulfilling. Um, but on Friday night, I, uh, she looked at me and she probably thought I was crying because the, what's the, what's the, the kids thing that the sponsor kids, oh, Compassion, Compassion International was talking and they were talking about sometimes parents have to give up their child for the love of their child because they can't, they're going to die. That child is going to die and they have to give up their child. And I was making a choice to give up my child for my own selfish reasons. And um, I looked down at Corbin and he was so happy and he was in this place of just pure joy and and if I chose that path it's easy it's so easy guys the wrong path is so easy it is so wide the Bible says that the path to evil is so wide and it was so easy for me to continue to make that choice but if I made that choice I wouldn't have been the one that lost that joy I would have lost it and I would have soon spiraled back into drugs and alcohol I'm sure but my my son wouldn't have had it because I didn't have joy in my life for a long time and I have no idea how God saved our marriage other than 
fervent per- prayer from Maya. But I'm so glad that he did for if, if that one moment just made me realize that even years later I can look and say, that is a result of the right decision. And it was hard. I was, I was frustrated about things. We have things we get caught up in and we can, we can justify anything in our lives and continue to go down that path. But this next song, wow, I wish this was planned. <laughs> I really do. This next song is I Know You Will. And uh, I have no idea how God got us to where we are at today. But I love you guys. I love my wife. And uh, I love my kids. And I'm so glad that God has blessed us with a beautiful family, a love for Jesus, and a, and a burning fire to go and serve him. And, uh, and I don't know what you're trying to figure out today, what road you're walking down this wide path, but you have got to turn around and you got to go down that narrow path and it's going to be hard and it's going to take some scripture. It's going to take some prayer. It's going to take some friends. It's going to take a whole lot of stuff because it takes work. Life's not easy. We don't come in here on Sunday and pretend to praise and worship and give you guys the message and, and you guys walk out there and it's, and it's run free. Life is hard. We try to equip you to, to serve in that, that narrow road, but it takes more than Sunday morning, guys. And uh, as we sing this song, just let that go. Whatever it is, know you're going to walk out here today and that wide path is closed. It's shut off. I don't know how you'll make a way, but I know you will. Amen. Amen. runs dead, you can see a way I don't, and it makes no sense, but you say that's what faith is for, when I see a flood, you see a promise, when I see a grave, you see a dome, when I'm at my end, you see where the future starts. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. You've been good on every promise, from Eden to Zion, through every dead end and out of that grave. Don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. Sing that line again. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. When the world's on fire, it's not like you don't have a plan. When the earth gives way on this rock, your church will stand. Nothing has ever once surprised you. Nothing has ever made you flinch And when it all shakes out The gates of hell don't stand a chance Amen I don't know how you make a way But I know you will I don't know how you make a way But I know you will You've been good on every promise From Eden to Zion Through every dead end and out of that grave, I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. One more time. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. You pulled my heart from Egypt. You carved a road through sea. From all our chains to endless praise, the story ends in you. You pulled my heart from Egypt. You carved a road through sea. From all our chains to endless praise, the story ends in you.
You're so good. Thank you for, for just bringing us to you. And uh, sometimes we walk the other way, but you continue to follow. That path to turn around never moves. You continue to follow, and all we have to do is turn, boom, it's over. And we are thankful for that. You don't wait back here, so the further you move away, the longer we got to get back. It is just instantaneous, and we are so blessed. We are so honored. And we love you. Amen. 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 Give it up for the worship team, my goodness, amen. You know, I really love and appreciate Justin for just being real, amen. You know, it's easy to uh, put on a, a front and think, oh, you know, I got all my act together, it's all the rest of y'all that got problems. I don't know about you, but I'm part of the rest of y'all, and I got, I got just as much problems as you have. It's good to know we have as much as Justin, too, though, huh? That's why I was worried, but no, he, good. Thank you, sir. Good stuff. Hey, it's going to be 53 degrees Tuesday. And Thursday, it'll call for 8 to 12 inches of snow. <laughs> wow. We are in Hoosier country. Where they're like, yeah, snow. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, wow, it's, uh, it's quite, quite a change. Hey, a couple of things. I'm, I'm doing the communion today on the fifth Sunday, and, and uh, children's ministry pastor, they usually will take the fifth Sunday and go visit their family, and so it kind of gives a break for all the leaders. We still have nursery downstairs if you want to avail yourself to that, and so feel free to do so. Uh, a couple of things. A shout out to a, a gentleman down in Florida. who was. You remember when I was giving a message about the word uh, t that Jesus saves to the uttermost there in Hebrews. And it's only used twice in Scripture. Once there, it means complete, whole. And the, the first time it's used was the woman in the synagogue who was bent over for 18 years. Remember that? And Jesus said, woman, you are loose. You are. Now you have to stand up. And she stood up. And instantly she was healed. Well, a gentleman in Florida was having back problems when, and watching online, and I guess someone sent him the, the link, and he was watching, and he said, as soon as I said, stand up, he said, you know what? He stood up, and by faith, his back was healed right then. I was like, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Can, is that legal, by the way? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Trust in the Lord and just see God touch and heal you, man. And I also want to give a shout-out to a gal in Illinois that wrote to us, uh, watches online in Candy. And she just asked, said, would Pastor, would you in the church pray for me? Uh, I've been struggling greatly with the fear and rule-driven image of the Lord. You know, that, that God's, you know, just always there waiting for you to mess up. And when you do, you know, hey, he's going to point this out. You know, that that's not the Lord. You know, the word convict, we like to use the word convict. The word means to convince. And so when it comes to believers, he convinces us that our righteousness is in Jesus Christ. And it's when we are in a low times in life, that's when we need the convincing the most. So it doesn't take much to convince me that I've sinned. Who said amen? Is that my wife? Oh, okay, amen. 
And, uh, but it takes the work of the Holy Spirit to convince me that in Christ I am and always shall be righteous because of Jesus' work. Amen? Amen. And this gal wrote that she's been struggling with this image of God and, and the fact she said, I, I've listened through many sermons on this subject, but it says the majority of a lot of pastors, uh, and this may just be in Illinois, I don't know, um, it's a different message, and some are more legalistic, and some, now this is subtle, listen to what she's saying, uh, some mix both God's love along with obedience, obedience being a key for God's blessings. Now, you, th there's a very subtle thing there if you're listening to what she's saying. She's getting the revelation, it's got to come by revelation, that your blessings are not because you're good. That your blessings are because God is good. That's why. It's because Jesus did the work of the cross. Jesus makes us righteous. Jesus deserves all the blessings. We receive all the blessings. Amen? And he gets the glory for all the blessings. If you live a Christian life of always trying to work and earn your blessings through obedience. Now, for the record, for those keeping record, Pastor Tim is not for disobedience. Well, that's great, Pastor. I could go out and be disobedient. I'm not for disobedience. But I'm here to tell you, you are not blessed because you did this or did that. You're blessed because Jesus did that on the cross. What he did on the cross provides the blessings for us. We walk in that. And this is called the obedience of faith, 1 John. So the obedience of faith is to believe that. And so a shout out to Candy, and, and, and she just asked her prayer. So Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for Candy there in Illinois. We ask your blessing on her. Thank you. Continue to deliver her and free her from this wrong belief of you, that you are not a smiting God waiting to just crush us after every mistake. You, you are a God who is there that loves us because when you look at us, you see Jesus. You don't see us. You see the perfect work of your son. And so I just bless Candy, encourage her, raise her up, help her father to just rest in the power of the Almighty and your work on the cross and on her behalf. And Father, thank you for John down in Florida. Uh, we pray for continued healing for his back. Help him, Father. Thank you that he was so excited that he even uh, played a song and, and videoed it and sent it. And so, Father, we just thank you for your love and what you're doing here, near, and far. Use us, Lord, to be a light to anyone we come in contact with, and we'll be sure to bless you. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. amen. If you have your elements, by the way, if you need some, there are trays on the side, up front, little communion creamer things in the back. Hey, you like those a little... Those are like those uh, creamer container things. You got to come early to figure out how to get that top lid off. Yeah, our, our first group, you know, one of our members is 95. And he, first thing he does, he comes in, gets that thing, sits down, and goes, all right, gets the peel over. And I'm like, Teed, we have some that aren't that designed that way anymore. You get a little cups. He goes, yeah, but he's up for the challenge. He goes, yeah, get this thing. And so he blesses my heart. As we were about to go to communion, you know, there's a thing of the law of first use. And what I find interesting is when we think of communion time, you know, we have two symbols. We have bread and we have wine, in this case, grape juice. You know, for those, it's like, oh, wine. That's okay. Don't, don't let that bother you. These are the two elements. They're simply elements. They're symbols of communion, common union, what brings us together. Well, do you know the first time you see the bread and the wine together is in the book of Genesis, chapter 14. We've been going through Melchizedek. Remember, remember talking about Melchizedek? That was Christ in the Old Testament meeting with Abraham. He was a king of righteous, king of Salem, which means complete, full, whole, perfect. The king of Salem meets Melchizedek or Melchizedek, meets Abram. He just went, remember, do you remember the scenario, the setting, the chapter opened up, and there was five bad kings, and they come down and beat up on these other kingdoms, or excuse me, four bad kings, thank you. And the four bad kings came and beat up on the other guys, and then five of the kings got together, and they went to war and said, okay, it's five against four, we'll take them. And they go up, and the four kings outed the five kings. Remember that? You're like, yeah, I read it every night, Pastor. <laughs> yeah. And so, so here they are, 
the five kings get beat up by four kings, and then one of the messengers come back, you know, all banged up and bruised, like, <laughs> Abraham, oh, yeah, these guys, they just beat us up. But they also took your nephew. Just thought I'd tell you. And off he goes. And do you remember what Abram did? Abram's like, what? He gathered up not soldiers, but servants, 318 of his servants. Remember, we know the number because it's my wife's birthday, 318. 318 servants, and what do they do? The servants, not five kings and their soldiers, 318 servants go, and they beat up the four bad kings. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like, oh, I would love to have seen that. God gave them the victory, and now they're marching back from that battle, and Melchizedek will go down and join Abram in the valley of what we know, Kidron Valley. Here's what he says. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, remember, peace, perfect completion, wholeness, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him, Abram. Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. You see, under Melchizedek is blessings, blessings, blessings. He never, he never pronounces curses. He pronounces blessings to Abram. But what I want to point out in the midst of sharing the, the wine and the bread with Abram, this time of communion, right after a wonderful victory, there were two interesting things that you want to catch in that text. The verse just before it, it said, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley, the Kidron Valley. The king of Sodom, his name in our, ch in our chapter there, verse 2, is Bera, B-E-R-A, Bera, Bera, however you want to pronounce it, B-E-R-A. His name means son of evil. That's what Bera means, son of evil. He was there when Melchizedek came out to meet Abram. After they had this time of communion, immediately after, and the king of Sodom, son of evil, said to Abram, give me this, the persons and take all the goods for yourself. And Abram said, not so, lest everyone, or you tell everyone else that Barum made me rich. He says, I give everything to you. So he knew what this guy would do. If I kept anything back, I know that you will use it for evil and tell everybody that I'm your mercenary. You hired me, made me rich, and that's why we went and beat up those guys. And so I see the, the son of evil there, and you see it's in the Kidron Valley, which the Jewish word is Kadar, uh, Q-A-D-A-R, which means darkness. So isn't it interesting? We, we think, what a beautiful picture of Melchizedek and having a bread and a wine and a time of communion with Abram and worshiping God and the God Most High and Abraham's been blessed by the God Most High and right after the victory. But here's what I want to point out. You may be in a dark valley. They were in a dark valley, but they were the light in that dark valley. You may just be coming off of a victory, great success. But here's what I, I, one thing I learned this week. The greatest enemy of success is success. Because you've had the success, you're like, oh, everything's fine. But on the heels of success, the son of evil showed right up. And there was a temptation following this time of communion. So I'm here to tell you, if you may be going through a dark, dark valley, you may have temptations coming your way, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus wants to have a time of communion with you. He wants you to know you are blessed no matter what is happening around you, no matter who's waiting to talk to you afterwards, you know, in your heart and spirit, no matter what, how dark your valley is, you are in a place of blessing if you are in a place of Jesus. Amen? So it's like, yeah. So being that, that we are in a place of blessing, here's what Jesus said. The night he was what? Betrayed. Whoop, betrayed. See, I'm half Italian probably because I talk with my hands. So... Evil was present, a son of evil right there present. He took bread and he thanked. He said, thank you, Father. So, Lord, we thank you for our Lord Jesus allowing his body to be beaten and bruised for us. Father, thank you that you sent the Lamb of God, inspected to be perfect, and inspected by all around him and found no fault in him. Thank you that you are the perfect substitute for us. And we receive this element, Lord, as a symbol of your beating and bruising on our behalf. Thank you for the victory in Christ. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Shall we? The same night he took the cup. It's going to be a very dark night. He's going to spend the evening in the, the Garden of Gethsemane. In the midst of that darkness, in the presence of the son of evil, he still gave thanks for the blood he was about to shed. So, Lord Jesus, thank you that you shed your blood on our behalf. Thank you that it's by your stripes we are healed. No other reason but by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so we celebrate you today. We celebrate this cup, and we thank you in Jesus' name. We all say amen, shall we? Amen. Amen. All right. For those who have been timing me in the length of my communion message, <laughs> I got good news for you. It's not being followed by a sermon from me. Because you're like, oh, man, we're going to be in overtime. <laughs> no, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. This weekend, we had a family come up and visit with us and interview with us and, and spend some time with us. Daniel and Eve, Eve is in the back. Okay. I'll have them, I'll have Daniel introduce everyone. He said you're going to come up and sing. Is that right? No, just kidding. All right, just kidding. With me. We've been in search of a, an associate over discipleship, outreach, heart for missions, or family life ministry here. And so, uh, so God has brought the two of us together, and we're just trying to discern the will of God for us as a body and for them as a family. We want them to be right where God wants them to be. Amen? And we want to be right where God wants us to be. And so we've enjoyed our time. It's, uh, it's been a blessing to have Daniel with us over the weekend, and uh, he's going to come share the word with you. Now, a couple things. You're not allowed to say amen more than you say it when I'm preaching. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Anyways, Daniel, you come. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you want to say amen, you just hold, like you're holding up a sign. That's all you got to do. Let's awesome. rehearse. <laughs> well, wow. Wow. No, no, that's no longer the sign. It's no longer the sign. <laughs> wow. You got, you got true followers right here, huh? Well, it is, it is a pleasure. It is an honor to be here with my family. Uh, you have to know that we love Columbus. Columbus, Indiana has a very special place in our heart for many reasons. Of the many things is the first place here in the United States that the Lord brought us to serve together with my family. When we first came, we were only four. My wife and my two oldest uh, Honduran kids, uh, Harrison Daniel, uh, I think he's serving down there with the kids. Uh, I don't know how I love it that you have allowed him to be there. So uh, I'm nervous for him. And for the church as well. Because <laughs> being a pastor, is, there's a lot of liability that goes on over there. But I'm hoping, and, and not just that, he is with his good fellas, Micah and Zach. <laughs> I won't say anything more. <laughs> and uh, we came here with, we were four, and then the Lord blessed us here and gave me a little husher. Uh, Isaac, my 30-year-old boy, was born here in Columbus uh, Hospital right here. So God blessed me with that. So every time we will always, regardless of what the Lord does for my family and for this church, we will always be coming back to Columbus. It is my third son's hometown. So we have to bring him here and get him to know uh, the architecture of this town and and eat at the moose chocolate for crying out loud. And and go and go go to Zigzag. There you go. So you know, see English is not my first language. So yeah, I call it Swansig. Not whatever y'all call it. But uh, my family understand it. And then the Lord moved us to Dallas and gave me a beautiful little girl that was born in Dallas. So I had two Honduran boys and two American uh, uh, so the Lord has been tremendously graced. I really thank the pastor, Pastor Tim, and, and his wife, Jerry, for allowing us to be with them, get to know you. It's been wonderful to be back in Columbus and get to know many of you already in several meetings. But also, number two, Columbus has a special place because it gave us family. 
He gave me faith family. Many of them are here that are really, really close to our hearts. I have, I have my parents from Indiana. I got my papa bear and my mama bear and, and their family here that they're so close to us. I have Miss Joyce, Coach Gary Robertson, that every time we hear, we are here in Columbus, we have to see them. If I don't see them, I'll be punished, literally. I have the demand family that, uh, you know, we minister together and it, it makes me so... So thankful to see you serving right here and almost getting married. Oh my goodness, I'm getting old. Uh, and getting to know many of you, the demands, the Allen family, Lindsay that grew up in our children's ministry. And, and, and it, it's just so nice to see all of you again. But I did not come to talk about this. I always put my clock so that I don't pass as a good pastor. Uh, I don't know if your pastor does. Oh no, he passed. <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, man. Uh, I believe, I truly believe. Well, before we, I tell you what I truly believe, let's bow our heads and let's pray so that we ask for God. I, we ask God for his guidance. So let's pray together. Heavenly and gracious Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that it convinces, like Pastor said this morning, it convicts us to come to your word and, and, and illuminates us to see your truth, your truth. Speak to each one of us this morning. Encourage us, comfort us if we need us, and just draw us closer to you, to your character, to your love, to your grace, so that we, we individually, as family, as a church, we can display your love, your grace, your mercy to those that don't know it. I pray all this in Jesus' name, and everyone says... So I truly believe that everyone, everyone has really moments. And by that I mean that uh, we have those moments where when you say something, you go, really? You know, I have many of them. Some of them are fading away because, you know, uh, it used to be where I could say, uh, they would ask me, instead they would say, oh, Daniel, how old are you? So, you know, I could go and now I say the truth, of course, I'm about to turn 42 years old. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is the part where I don't do a sign, but you participate with me. <laughs> yes, and people would go, really? Yeah, you know, it used to be where they could tell me that, oh, yeah, you look like 20 ish. I'd be, ah, amen to that, <laughs> you know? But nowadays, that's fading away. I'm getting wrinkled and and I'm getting darker my hair is falling off more often so you know that's one of them the second one is that they would ask me how is it uh, so are you married and I go yes so people would go yes how is it that you with that big nose with those teeth with those baggy eyes thin guy have such a wonderful and beautiful woman my wife is sitting right there would you please stand darling see so I tell people that is grace undeserved gift I don't deserve her at all and she puts up with this sinful man over here so it's like one of those really moments and then they see my kids and when they see my kids, you have to understand this. Uh, uh, when I'm picking up my kids at a park or at a, at a playground and they see that my kids are crying, they think I'm kidnapping them. <laughs> because I'm Hispanic. <laughs> and then, you know, I go, no, that's, that's my wife. Oh, oh, okay. You know, what happened here? So they go, are those your kids? You know, yes, they are. So they go, really yeah they are my kids you know gladly they all look like their mom they don't none of them look like me so I praise God for that and then they would they asked me here in the states they asked me Daniel what is it that you do so I tell you know because they think that I no no negative connotation on this please understand 
uh, they think that I paint houses or mow yards, you know, or drive something or build something. None of the above. I'm useless at the construction. My wife actually is the builder in the house. I, ha I need help to, put, to change a light bulb, literally. I am that useless. I'm opening up my heart. And then uh, no construction at all. I'm one of those that I learned in Argentina that I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that, can you get me that? Can you go get me a hammer? Can you hold the ladder? That's me. That's me. You know, so, and, and so when they ask me, so what is it that you do? And I tell them, well, I'm a pastor. So they go, really? really? Oh, you pastor a Hispanic church. And I go, no, I pastor in an American church. And I go, so they go, really? And I go, yeah, I mean, those elders and those deacons must be crazy. And I tell, I tell them that every Sunday morning, you guys have no clue. Why is it? Oh, but you're a, you're a, you're a youth pastor. And I go, no. I'm either the associate pastor or a missions pastor or a teaching pastor. And in Honduras, I was the leading pastor of a church. For, uh, so they go, really? Yes, I pastor. I was a lead pastor for seven years in Honduras, a, a church over there. And then as I was pastoring that church, I was, there, I was a field director for SCORE International uh, Mission, a, a mission agency. So they think, wow, really? It, well, but what I have found out, and the point with all those really moments... What I found out is that those really moments really display our questioning and our unbelief to certain statements. So that's why we go, really? Because down deep, we don't really believe that what's being said. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that that is very similar when we come to God's word. Because we read passages well-known passages as Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. The Bible says that the 11 disciples went to Galilee as Jesus had directed them. And then verse 16 explicitly says, and when they saw him, Jesus resurrected. Matthew records, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Some went, really? The, rest, the one that had just died, it's alive again. Not just that, but immediately Matthew records and says in verse 18 that Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And but baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then we go, really? Is that for me? That's for them. That's for those. That's for the leaders. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that's for me. That's for you. For each one of us. So I believe, and, and the message that the Lord has put in my heart for the church this morning is to get rid of those really moments in our faith and become what I, what I see in the New Testament. What is it to look like to be a church for today? For now, you and I know that not only this country, but the world is going through a chaotic moment in history. Relativism has become the opportunity for every human being, including Christians, to stand and hold more our opinion and preference rather than sustaining and proclaiming the Bible, the truth. You and I have an opinion. You and I have a preference. And I always love to come to the word with this sense. If you see me right here, or if you see me, I don't know this, what's the name of this road? Uh, 45. Or if you see me right there on 46. Yeah, I used to be a hoosier. And you see me right there on 46, 
coming from Columbus or you're going from uh, uh, Nashville to Columbus and you see me right there on 46 just standing and making all these, uh, you know, signs and you're driving by, you, each one of the people that are passing by will have your own interpretation of what I'm trying to communicate. You know, some of you may think, oh, he's Hispanic. You just let him, let him go back to the border. Yeah, he's just... Some of you may, you know, say, he's trying to say something. I just don't know why. Some of you might think, well, he's crazy. Don't get, some of you might, might be even deeper. But and look at my signs and say, well, he's, he's probably in, in need of something. And so forth. So the point is that each one of you will have, you will filter that and you will make an interpretation of it considering what you're seeing. But the best and the closest interpretation you can get is if you stop the car, you get down and you ask the crazy Hispanic, hey dude, what's up? <laughs> Do you need something? I may, may not. So your interpretation may have been good, accurate. So when we come to God's word, it's sometimes, many times like that. We come to it thinking, oh, I think he's saying that. No, 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 no. I think he's saying that. No, 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 no. But I, and then we all have these filters. I believe that, you know, the Holy Spirit spoke to Paul and made him write the first letter of Thessalonica. So it's my job and your job to come and ask Paul, what do you mean, Paul? What do you mean by that? And not make myself. But relativism lately has made, made us believe that we are entitled to just come up with our own interpretations of it. In the name many times of using, yeah, no, you know, God, but we have to look at it as a whole. So that has shifted and has made us more confused to be a church for today, for today, to reach out this young fellow, this millennials and all this generation, X, G, G, W, F, 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 B, N, A, B, C, D, F. And the many more there are to come. So is it possible for New Life Church here in Brown County, Nashville, Indiana, to be a church for today? Yes. Yes. So today I got two points. And uh, if you have an outline over there, let me just walk you through it uh, as we go to this. And it's about the church of Thessalonica. It's a church that started... And this started, the beginning of the church, it's narrated in the book of Acts in one of the mission trips of Paul. So Luke records as he's writing a second volume, that's the book of Acts, to his good friend Theophilus. And he's writing to him. You got to keep that in mind as we read the letter. So he's writing to Theophilus to make him known what happened after Jesus resurrected. That he makes that clear in Acts chapter 1. And then when you get to Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, you read, you and I read the account, the narrative of how the church was started. So the church was started. And let's read God's word. It says, Acts 17, chapter 1, verse, chapter 17, verses 1 on. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, and as was his custom, and on, the three, seven, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them for the, from the scriptures. So the question that I asked Paul, Paul, what did you reason about? Verse three, Luke says, explaining and providing that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the death, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. So what were they debating for? The gospel, the centrality of the message, Jesus Christ. And that provoked a huge, uh, it brought huge consequences to the church, to the Jews right there. Because what, Jesus? No, they knew who Jesus was. Yes, they, did. they knew he was the son of a carpenter. He was a man. It couldn't be. And then Luke says, and some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. They believed, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. 
But notice verse five. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble. They form a mob. It seems like one of our big cities right here in the States, right? They just, you know, take wicked men and make a mob about, you know, saving or proclaiming or just making riots everywhere. They set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out of the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities shouted, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason, was, Jason has received them. And they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. That's how the church started. Years later, Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, Spirit writes a letter to the people that started right there. Is the letter to the Thessalonians. So go back quickly with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the, to the church. To the body, to the group of Christians, of Thessalonians, and God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to me among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became, a, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So how can we, how we have the big picture now, how the church started with the preaching of the gospel, with affliction and confliction and riots, and then the church is formed, the church grows up, and then Paul is telling me, okay, I remember you on this, but this is what's going, this is what I hear from you. I believe there are great lessons for us as a church so that we, the church of Christ, so that you, New Life Church, be the church for today. First thing, I think that if we want to be, if I, think, I think if the church wants to be a church for today, it needs to be a church that exalts only and exclusively the glory of God. It exalts, it displays, it projects, it points people, not to me, not what he's doing to me, but he points it to him, to the glory of God. Everything God created is for his own glory. It's for his purpose. It's for him. You and I are created for his enjoyment, for his glory. So as we think about that, this is what I believe has happened. That nowadays we think in these terms that the church exists for my comfort for my blessing, 
so that I can display my preferences, my method, my dress code, my music. And we forget that we're here to display his glory, his grace, his love, his forgiveness, his advancement of his kingdom on this earth. And I think that has to do at least with three things. The first one, that means that we keep the gospel in front of us constantly. So letter A. That means that if we want to exalt only the glory of God, it starts with the gospel. It starts with the message. The narrative in Luke verse 17, chapter 17 verse 3. Clearly and explicitly, Luke narrates that the debate they were having, it was not about music. It was not about politics. It implied in that context a little bit of politics as we read at the end. But it didn't. It wasn't about abortion. It, it wasn't about immigration. The main point was explaining and providing arguments that it was necessary for the anointed one, for the Christ, to suffer and to rise from the dead because they were expecting someone else. Because the Jews were expecting a king. A deliverer, no one, no one was expecting a king, a Messiah that had to suffer. And Paul says, that's my argument. I need you to understand that, you know, he debated constantly with the Jews. The, the Christ, the anointed one needed to suffer and to be risen from the dead. And he clearly says that Messiah is no one else but Jesus. That's whom I'm talking about. But we have to understand that the gospel is connected to Jesus. It's rooted to Jesus. But I think when I speak about keeping the gospel in front of us, it means that we need to proclaim the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is clear in scripture. We have to tell and keep in front of the people, if we want to be a church for today, that Romans 3.23 says that we are all sinners. I was suspecting a natural one right there. <laughs> but you're with me. I like that. We need to understand the people that come in and the people as we go out, they need to hear us that we understand and that they need to understand what is our eternal condition according to the Bible. We may be morally good, but the Bible declares that I, Daniel Bardales, is a sinner. And that my sin separates me eternally from God. That I was born with that sin. That I am naturally pulled to the wicked, pulled to evil. Because that's my nature. That's my sinful nature. That's the bad news that we find here. And then it gets worse. Romans 6.23. The gospel means that, uh, the, part, the bad news of the gospel means that the wages of that sin is. We need to keep it in front. People are getting confused. They're, they're coming to believe that their, their marriage or their problem can be solved. And God can do that as a result of believing in Jesus, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is that I know that I'm a sinner and that the wages of my sin keeps me separated. And the gospel says that I cannot do anything to save myself. That I need someone to save me that I can be just as good, that I can be old church, that I can raise my hands, that I can close my eyes, that I can sing, that I can be here, that I can preach. But I need to have a personal relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ. I need to believe on through faith that I've been saved through grace, that I don't deserve that gift. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And yes, as we live by the gospel, God can restore your marriage. God can pull you out of drugs. God can do miracles as you walk through the gospel. But it starts with the gospel. You got to believe the gospel. We have to understand that Jesus died, yes, for the world, but he died for me. We have to make it personal. And I believe that nowadays, 
a church for today needs to be driven by that because many of us are just driven by emotion of a superficiality about the gospel but we need to have we need to be convinced as the pastor said by the holy spirit by the word of god that we are sinners and i need to be saved and the good news the gospel is that romans 5 8 that even though i am a sinner christ not daniel not my religious background not the things that i do none of these things took up my sin and nailed it on the cross but jesus christ he took your sin my sin and nail it on the cross he is the one that needs to be exalted he needs the one that i need to believe that took my place daniel's place because who the one that needed to be on that cross was you and me but jesus said no no i love them so much that i have come here to do the will of my father so that they if they believe may have eternal life what unites you and me it's not that we are all together here. It's not that I'm Honduran and you're American. What unites you and me is that we believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross. So we are called brothers and sisters. We're going to heaven not because we display our preference. We're going to heaven because we believe in Jesus Christ. Implication number two. It's a church that experiences affliction. You saw the beginning. People went to the house. People, the Jews got people. They were like, no, these, they need to be out of here. So church, New Life Church, as you become a gospel-driven church, you got to be ready for affliction. You got to be ready individually and as a church. There will be attacks from, from the evil one, and there will be attacks from us, unmature believers, people that think we believe but we don't we have to understand that today each one of us must deny ourselves take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ daily constantly the victory of yesterday is from yesterday I need to have faith today again I don't need to wait to gather on Sunday to have to feel empowered by the Holy Spirit because I have a relationship with God even though through the affliction the afflictions don't go away just because we gather here together the afflictions go away because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ and they are real I was serving here about five years ago and you think that well you know we're pastors and and everybody in life in Christian life is just about the good things and I was serving on Tuesday on what we used to call the Olympian ministry Lindsay was there and many kids we always did this ministry on Tuesday afternoon and that Tuesday afternoon of May 16 of 2017 my wife calls down the aisle and gives me the phone and says you need to receive this call you need to talk to your uncle my uncle who's in Dallas so I got the call and my uncle told me your dad is dead he's been assassinated in Honduras And since I've, I've learned to be authentic, like Justin was saying over here, no spirituality in all these. I went to a room and I cried and I cried and I cried. And I cried. I told my uncle, I can't believe it. No, it's not true. And then I saw, I heard, this is how I know it was not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I saw Miki from Rocky Balboa. I'm a huge Rocky Balboa fan. And I literally, because I saw my dad introduced me to that movie. And I saw Mickey telling me, Daniel, get up, son. You got one more round. I literally cut up, cleaned up my eyes, went back outside, and finished our ministry. Preached. But you know what? It has taken me five years to understand that even the believer goes through the deepest afflictions. We will suffer as Christians much but as we become a church of today we will find that those afflictions have an answer in a church for today where there's understanding where there's love where there's compassion 
where there's grace. Because God gave me people as I came back from Honduras. With, they had a bunch of flowers in my garden. I guess that's something y'all do here. It was new for us. But what I'm trying to communicate, it's not easy to be a Christian. It's not easy to be a church for today. We have so many hurting people. So many people that are going through afflictions that we need to minister to them. And how do we do that? Well, number three, a church for today experiences constantly transformation by the Holy Spirit. Constantly. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. I urge you to present yourself as a living sacrifice. Do not conform to this world. Do not take the form. But instead transform. Starting with the way you think. So that you may experience. It's real what is the good will of God. We just sang about that. His will is perfect. Is good. So now I understand. That God allowing the death of my dad was for his glory. Is for his glory. So that I don't take the form of this world. The victimized. Oh I'm so sorry. Please pray for me. Cry for me. No because he is in a better place. He is all eternity worshiping Jesus Christ. And I'm going there. And my hope is not that I may see him. My hope is that I see Jesus right there. I won't have time to look for my dad. I may see him. But my comfort now is that the transformation of the Holy Spirit that happens right here in the book, in the book, in the book, church of today has stopped me. Verses 1, 5 of 1 Thessalonians. Because of our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power. And in the Holy Spirit with full convincing of who he really is. And as he begins the letter, he says, he mentions it and he remembers God, verse 3. He remembers them before God because of their work of faith and labor and steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course we can be a church for today. Because we know our destiny. And number two. Church for today is not only a church that exalts the glory of God by keeping the gospel and knowing that we will experience affliction uh, and experiencing constantly transformation. But number two, it's a church for today that has a global impact. Global impact. If you read the book of Acts, starting from chapter 8 on, you will notice the life-changing style of these early Christians, how they went out, being persecuted, afflictions, being transformed, but presenting the gospel as they went. As they were going out, serving fully for a better cause. That means for you and me that the church for today must be of a global impact. We have to think about the eternity of all these ones that don't know Jesus. Not only in our county, not only in our surroundings. But again, Matthew 28 says, go therefore and make disciples of all. Some of you are still with me. Go therefore and make disciples to all nations. All ethnicities. So don't let that, when you meet for assembly, for family meetings, for mission committee. Don't let that be a, really? Do we have to? Do we have to think about going out there to these other countries, to Honduras, which is the first most violent country in the world? More than Ira. I think we went back to number four, but still to Honduras? Where these two little Hondurans have a little school for underprivileged kids. And, and really? We, we got to go there? We got to think about that? We got to pray about that? If we want to be a church for today, we must have a global impact vision. And think about the globality. Think about those and partner with those because we won't be able to do it alone. But partner with those that are doing the word of the Lord and that are presenting the gospel constantly in these other parts of the, of the earth that we can go. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we do that by reproducing 
Christ followers. That implies discipleship. We do that by reproducing ourselves in others. 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 6 through 7 says, And you became imitators of us and on the Lord. You receive, notice the stress, you receive the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So that, look at that clause, so that, that's a purpose clause, you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. A church for today doesn't need advertisement out here because the community shouts out. They're doing something over there. It's weird. I see a bunch of weird people. Lately, there was a little Hispanic over there screaming. <laughs> but as we think about reproducing ourselves, let me illustrate this. I, I know a pastor, a very good friend of mine. I wish you would known him. Uh, through SCORE International. His name is Craig McClure. He's American, as, as, as he can be, you know, American. From Atlanta, Southern, redneck. <laughs> Goes to Dominican Republic with his wife, who's a missionary kid that lived all her life in Mexico. And they're in Dominican Republic in the Batays, the poorest of the poorest of Dominican Republic. With a, a lot of Dominicans, curly, Kids with no shoes, just shorts or underwear, running around everywhere. And the Lord called him there to plant a church. So I visited through SCORE and I went there to teach there and preach there. The first thing he says, you know, Daniel, when you preach there, please don't wear a coat. Well, you know, I come from a Baptist background. I'm like, Phew. well, well, okay, you know, take off the coat. And you can wear shorts. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't go there. I need freedom there. I need you to pray for me that. I need you to lay hands on me for that. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it. And, and if you have flip-flops, you can do flip-flops. Oh, all of you are condemned now. <laughs> Preaching flip-flops. Anyways, I stood there. And when I saw that church singing Amazing Grace in a merengue style, I was like, Wow. It opened up my eyes. Mission trips do that. So you see the global impact. So you see that my preference here in home, it, it talks about my preference than God himself. So we become a church for today as we reproduce Christ, true Christ followers, followers that are willing to lead and let their life on the ground for the cause of the gospel. As we reproduce Young fellas that are willing to sacrifice time and talents and resources for the sake of the gospel. As we see young couples looking at their marriage and saying, yes, we need to reproduce in our kids a true faith that they go to church. Not because I go to church, but because they have a relationship with the Lord. So that my grandkids can also grow knowing the God that I worship and serve the God that I serve. As we reproduce, as they become example for the believers. But not only that, not only, not only we reproduce Christ followers, but it's a church that goes out, goes out, not just comes in. My prayer for new life is that we get, you get as excited when you come Sunday as you go out through Monday through Friday out there. Have you noticed that when we get adjusted and very comfort with our Christian life, we come Sunday and it's a full blown here. But as we go from Monday to Friday, it seems like I need to be here because I can get that over there. When the church for today becomes a, a church for today is a church that has understood that we gather here for encouragement so that we go out there and ready on the trenches, whether it be your elementary school, whether it be your high school, whether it be your university campus, whether it be your job, whether it be your home, whether it be your neighbor, you are on a mission. Whether it be like taking your next uh, business trip somewhere out there into the domestic area so you're taking the gospel be someone will be sitting right there to you 
and they will, you just need to press the right button. What do you think about the president right now? Oof. You may either agree or disagree, but you have an opportunity to speak about the gospel. I'm not saying do that so that you can tick them off. I'm saying look for opportunities. Because a church for today teaches its members to think about globally, not just inwardly. And you're just, we just read it on verses 6 through uh, 5 and 6. And then 1 Thessalonians verses 7 to 8. So that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Notice verse 8. For not only has the word, the word of the Lord sounded forth like an echo. That's the Greek, that's the Greek word right there. From you in Macedonia and Achaia. But your faith, your faith has gone forth everywhere so that Paul says I don't have to say anything in those areas because you guys are resounding constantly over there in all this area about the gospel about the transformation that Jesus does amen, amen. <sighs> how do we do that together number one we do that by serving others and I must say that in this church I've noticed how you guys serve unconditionally and I praise God for that and I urge you in a loving way to continue doing that verses 9 of Thessalonians says that these Christians turned their ways from to God from idols and you're serving so we serve one another and as you heard there are bulletins that we as pastors do there are places I encourage you I commend you I exhort you in a loving uh, way find a way to serve there are always needs in church it's it's one of those places the church of Jesus Christ shouldn't have need for servants I urge you we become a church for today when there is the, the where we need to be like in the old testament like Moses saying stop don't bring anymore for the temple stop it there should be here, you know, we want to announce that, no, there's no places right here. We got to wait for, you know, the next following three months so that a, a slot is open so that you can come and serve. Because we're full right now. We, we, we got no space. And, and, and as pastor says, I've learned this week, if, if there's no space, what, you got the burn? Go ahead. Serve. But it seems like sometimes there's always a spot that there's a need. So we become, you become a church for today as we serve one another, as we take care of our needs one another. Just as the church of Acts, chapter, chapter, chapter 2, when they were selling their stuff so that there was no need. They had things in common. And lastly, by testifying, testifying about Jesus' return. We don't know when he's coming. You may read, you may find prophets nowadays, you may find people that may know, you may find, we find hints. You may look at the eschatological clock on Israel. You may have, we may have differences in our eschatological theology. We just, at the bottom line, we just don't know when Jesus is coming back. What we know at the end of the day is that for sure he's coming. For sure he's coming. Undoubtedly, he is coming for his church. And if, we, if you want to be a church for today, we need to be that up front. The king of kings, the creator, the second person of the Trinity is coming back. Is coming back for you and for me. That's my hope. So, as you think about this week and about what this year has for you. I always ask at the end of the sermon today in my first hour, do you know how many Hondurans we can fit in a car? <laughs> always one more. <laughs> always one more. If you never know, if you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, pastor is going to be here and I've seen it before there will be people here elders deacons that can guide you through Jesus Christ to know the gospel if you need to know Jesus Christ don't leave 
this room thinking that you know him, thinking that you may know, be sure today. Because in order to be a church for today, it starts with the gospel. But to you, church, new life, if you, if you are committed, convinced, convicted by the exposition of his word and the Holy Spirit that lives within you, and you say today, Pastor Tim, I want to make a commitment, a public commitment, a surrender that I want to be a part to be a church for today. A church that thinks globally. A church that thinks to exalt Christ above all preferences. I'm here to help you, pastor. Come right here to the altar and tell our pastor. I, I want us as a church to be a church for today that serves one another. That when afflictions come, I'll be there and say, send me, send me. When there's no one to preach, teach me, equip me so that I can be an example for the flock. How to do it. Teach me so that when I'm there having coffee at Lukabee or when I'm having pizza at Big Woods, I can speak to the waiter. I can talk to them and at least I can open a door. How to pray for unbelievers because I only pray for my selfish things. And it's okay, but I need to think globally. If you're, if you're that person, I will invite you, Pastor. Amen. Let's stand together. Don't you wish you'd get a little more passionate about it? <laughs> hey, maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here and you don't know Christ your Savior. If you were to die today, you're not 100% sure you'd spend eternity in heaven. This is a day to do it. You come, we will introduce you to Jesus Christ. Wherever your need is, maybe you're here and say, today's my day. I, I am here to commit myself fresh and new to serving and spreading the gospel. The invitation is open. Elders will be here to pray for you. Others will. You come. You come. As we sing, folks, be here to pray. You come. I want to burn for you. I want to burn for you. Light me on fire. I want to burn. It's calling you today. Don't put it off. I want to burn. Let's pray for you. Let's pray for you. I want to burn for you. Light me on fire. Cause I want to burn for you. Better to burn for him than to burn without him. Come today. God's calling you today. Lay it down. Let us pray for you. I'm gonna stay at your feet. You have a need Linger today. Maybe here you need to be with Maybe you. Just Lord. need to lay a burden down. Never Whatever that need. need is, you come today. You come. Yes, I wanna lay on your altar. Fan this flame with you, Lord, and stoke the ember. Light me on fire, cause I want to burn, I want to burn for you, I want to burn for you, light me on fire, cause I want to burn. Let's go about our week this week. You know, I don't know about you, but fire will be burning and be on fire for the Lord. And then it seems like the flames start dwindling. Then you got to get those coals stirred up again. And you just got to say, you know what? I don't want to just, you know, just smolder out. And meeting together, I often say it's like a campfire. You could pull a stick out of that fire and it'll burn for a little while, but then it just goes out. But if you put that stick with the other sticks, they all help each other stay on fire. Amen? That's why we assemble together, to help keep each other on fire for the Lord. Elders, we have a meeting right afterwards, and Daniel and Eve will join us. And 
there is a chili cook-off today. So we encourage you to, wait a minute, we have what? We have lots, so if you didn't bring any, you come get some, right? Chili of all kinds, they're voting for it. You can vote for your favorite. Um, yeah, I'll make no other chili comments. We'll just leave it there. So, <laughs> but yeah, it'll be a great time. There's also a love offering. There'll be baskets near the door. Uh, Pastor Daniels, or Daniel works as well outside the church in Texas to take care of his family. He's taking a week off work to be up with us, so we'd like to just help him out, cover some of these expenses, as well as the church body. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we don't want to just be coming in, hanging out, and going home. We don't want to come in and just have our ears tickled and say, oh, that's nice, and just let it go in one ear and out the other. But Father, we have a world around us that is dying. They're perishing. They're acting crazy. They're on that highway to hell, and they don't even know it. We were on that road until someone told us the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And you saved us, Lord. And you didn't save us to just sit and be idle. You saved us to go out and tell others and share that good news that all might hear the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to be about your business, occupied until you come. Help us to get out in the highways and hedgerows and compel them to come in that your house might be full. This was your desire for us and to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest field. So today, Father, we pray for laborers and we pray that we would be those laborers to get out there and share the good, the great news. The news is almost too good to be true, but it is true. Help us to share that with our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, others on a daily, regular basis. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this day to be here today. We bless you in the name of Jesus. We all say amen. Share the love, not the germs. And go get the chili. It burns all the germs out. Okay. Let this be a pleasing sacrifice. The offering I choose, it's my life. Emptied of the old and filled with you. Oh, Jesus, I want to burn for you. Let this be a pleasing sacrifice. The offering I choose, it's my life. Emptied of the old, filled with you. Oh, Jesus, I want to burn for you. For you.